years how to win in the modern game of law school admissions. Don't be fooled. The rubric for success has changed in this market. What worked in the 80s and 90s just won't cut it anymore. Unlike most other admissions counselors, I was in your shoes only a couple years ago, and I know what it takes now in this day and age to get into the best law schools. Just to give you an idea of the numbers, nowadays a top 10 law school receives about 15 applications for every spot in its first year class. I want to say that again. A top 10 law school receives about 15 applications for each spot in its first year class. And that's just top 10 schools. That's not even speaking on the top of the pyramid, Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. The most selective schools have no choice but to look beyond the numbers, as admissions folks are fond of saying. This means that hundreds of applicants with near-perfect LSAT scores and college grades will get turned away from the top schools. In 2010 alone, about 40% of all applicants to law schools were not able to go to any law school at all because they were not admitted anywhere. I want to say that again. In 2010 alone, about 40% of all applicants to law school were not able to go to any law school at all because they were not admitted anywhere. I had suspected it before, but now after having gone, I am convinced. The people who attend the most prestigious law schools are not smarter or more gifted or even more connected than everyone else. They are better prepared for the admissions process. It's true. Knowledge really is power. I went from living in a trailer park to living on campus at Harvard Law School. I know how to win in the modern game of law school admissions. This is how I did it and how you can too. In order to win in the modern game of law school admissions, you have to understand the game. So let's talk a little bit about what this is about and how you need to go into the process. First, know that you are not in Kansas anymore. If the college admissions game is a challenge, then the law school admissions game is a beast. From the LSAT, which made the SAT seem like a walk in the park, to the weeks of meticulously combing through my personal statement, Everything about the law school admissions process reminded me that I was in a whole new ball game. Whenever I got frustrated, and trust me, there were many times, playing in the back of my head like a broken record was that timeless line off of one of my favorite childhood movies. You are not in Kansas anymore. In high school, you are expected to be uncertain. It is a time when others anticipate and even encourage you to find yourself. By college, on the other hand, you are expected to have already found yourself. College admissions committees are far more forgiving of lackluster performance in high school than law school admissions committees will be of it in college. There are far too many applicants in the pool to be just average or even just above average. What worked 20 and even 10 years ago just won't pass muster nowadays. Those who do what everyone else does will get what everyone else gets. Distinguishing your application from the pack is absolutely key. Legally Blonde had that much right. So maybe you shouldn't spray your resume with perfume, but the gist still holds true. Always put your application together with one primary question in mind. How many people can say the same thing? This should always be at the back of your mind when you're going throughout your application process. How many other people can say the same thing? Bottom line, the more people who can say what you say, 
the less impressive it is. Think about it like this. Your chances of success are directly proportional to the number of people whose application is similar to yours. The fewer people who sound like you and who you sound like, the better your chances are. Law schools are looking to fill their classrooms with a diversity of perspectives. Your goal is for the law school admissions committee to see that you bring a viewpoint that no one else does. I elaborate much more on distinguishing yourself in my book, Daring to be Different, 25 Tips for a Life of Success, available online everywhere books are sold. Second, it's business, not personal. An admissions committee accepts a person because it feels that he or she will bring value to the law school in the near future. Some sort of value like money or notoriety or resources. It is not about them liking you or not, per se. Even if they like you and appreciate your story, you will not be accepted if the admissions committee does not see value in it for them. Don't forget, law schools are businesses first and educational institutions second. They're businesses, and admissions committees are making business decisions. You have to market yourself as any clever salesman would. But be careful. There is a thin line between bragging and marketing yourself. Your application should say it without saying it. Unlike college, which everyone is encouraged to attend, graduate school is very much still considered a luxury. And law school has always been the most insular of graduate schools. Bottom line, you really have to make the case for why you should be admitted to law school, much more than you did to get into college, especially in this economy. Remember, 40% of applicants to law schools won't be accepted anywhere. Things like always been my dream or lifelong goal, just won't cut it. Your application should be primarily an appeal to the interests of your audience, not their sympathy. Third, get your mind right. Henry Ford, one of the greatest minds of his time, once said, whether you believe you can or you cannot, Either way, you are right. This has never been truer for law school admissions. Of course, mindset is only one component, but it is nonetheless a crucial factor in the success of your application. You have to be mentally prepared for the entire process, from the weeks and weeks and weeks of practicing for the LSAT to the months of waiting for the decision of the admissions committee. Having what I call the two P's are critical throughout this process. Positivity and patience. People who apply and have a defeatist attitude are doing themselves a huge disservice. Saying things like, well, I'm sure I won't get in, or I know this is a long shot, will never help your cause. Don't apply if you don't think you can get in. I want to say this again. Don't apply if you don't think you can get in. Either change your thinking about it before you apply or don't apply at all. See yourself attending the law school before you ever apply. This is crucial. See yourself attending the law school before you ever apply. This is what I call seeing it as already done. Dean of Admissions at Georgetown Law School, Andy Kornblatt, put it best. Quote, the first tip I would give is to really take ownership and understand how you apply makes a big difference in whether or not you're going to get in. End quote. Last, don't let money decide your future. It really bothers me 
that so many people self-select out of applying simply because they don't think they can afford it. Trust me, I know what it's like to be there. Growing up, I knew it was no way my family could afford to send me to college, let alone law school. But I also knew that as long as I excelled, money would never limit my academic or personal goals. And it never has. I had a full tuition, room and board scholarship to college. I had half of my law school education paid for by grants and the other half through a very generous loan package. Bottom line, the money is out there. And when you are good at what you do, somebody will pay for you. Don't let money decide your future. Jim Ron, who was a world-renowned life coach, author, and success expert, once said, quote, the answer to your problems is simple. Become more valuable than others, end quote. Don't worry about where the money is going to come from. Instead, focus on becoming more valuable than others. When you are extraordinary, law schools will be calling you. I had two big name law schools offer me more money on top of the scholarships they had already offered me just so I would choose them. Another had their dean of admissions call me personally and offer me a full ride. When you are extraordinary, you'll be the one sending the law school a rejection letter. Like, I've received so many offers, but unfortunately, I can only attend one law school. <laughs> Although there might not be as many outside private scholarships and fellowships for law school as there were for college, there are still some, and most of them award a lot more than college scholarships generally do, which is definitely a plus. Browse the internet and ask around to find which ones you should apply for. Furthermore, in many cases, when you apply to a law school, you are also automatically considered for whatever scholarships and grants that school offers. So to not apply because you don't think you can afford it really makes no sense. Remember, the money is out there. Don't let money decide your future. Before we delve into the individual elements of the application, the factors of the game, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I call the seven signs and the seven slices. So first, the seven signs. Uh, and let me say first, both my assessment of the seven signs and the seven slices are based on my interactions with hundreds of educators and applicants and other ed law school admissions experts. The seven signs are the seven characteristics that law school admissions committees are looking for in their students. And they're, when they're selecting their student body, this is what they're looking for in their applicants. You want to write down these seven signs and keep these with you as we're going through the elements of the law school admissions game. Research skills, writing skills, analytical skills, international experience, distinctive cultural background, unique life experiences, and unusual hobbies or skills. These are the seven signs. These are the seven characteristics that law school admissions committees are looking for when they are selecting their student body. The first three demonstrate your ability to succeed in law school. Research skills, writing skills, analytical skills. The next four demonstrate your uniqueness, international experience, distinctive cultural background, unique life experiences, and unusual hobbies or skills. Next, let's talk about the seven slices. This is what I call the seven slices of the whole person pie. Now, you want to write these down as well, because what you want to do is 
show the seven signs within the seven slices. These seven characteristics of an ideal candidate, which are the seven signs you want to shine through your application, the seven slices. These are the seven slices that complete the whole person pie. GPA, LSAT, recommendations, extracurriculars, personal statement, X factor, and knowledge of the school. Now, although these are all slices of the whole person pie, these slices are equal slices. So I've taken the liberty, again, based on the interactions I've had with hundreds of educators and admissions experts in the field, of taking the liberty of breaking down into percentages how these slices are weighed when an application is being reviewed. GPA, 25%. LSAT, 25%. Recommendations, 15%. Extracurriculars, 10%. Personal statement, 10%. X factor, 10%. And knowledge of school, 5%. Now I have to say here as a note, for applicants who are not undergraduates, college GPA is weighted a lot less. I would estimate that it could count for as little as 15% for candidates who have already graduated. Other factors play in, such as your occupation and or your GPA in graduate school. So now let's delve into each of these slices or the elements of the law school admissions game. Your grade point average, or GPA for short. Your GPA can be your best friend or your worst enemy. The inconvenient truth is that this one factor is probably the most important. Bottom line, the better your grades, the better your chances. Remember, it's bigger than just the numbers. The person who shows substantial improvement is always going to fare better than the student with consistently mediocre grades. But the applicant with consistently good grades is in the best position. But don't think that your GPA is just about the actual number. Because schools understand that every college has its own computing system, admissions committees look to other factors like your ranking your class and the intensity of your core curriculum. It's not over until it's over. Sure, you can't go back in time, but every semester is a new opportunity for improvement. Don't use your past performance as an excuse to keep doing more of the same. For example, admissions committees are very willing to forgive freshman year issues or one off semester. But you can't make the argument that one semester or year was an academic anomaly if all of your grades stay more or less the same. Aim high. Set your bar high. Remember, you are competing against candidates across the nation and around the world who are interested in American law schools, not just your immediate peers. This is thousands, if not tens of thousands of other applicants. Ideally, you should aim to get an A on every exam that you take. So this means that you should be aiming for an A in every class that you take, every time. So your goal should be to get all A's every semester, every year, for all four years. Remember, shoot for the moon and you fall upon the stars. It never works the other way around. Pick a major you like. Some years ago, a survey was sent to law school deans, and one of the questions was what major they recommended students have in college in order to prepare effectively for law school. The four majors most frequently recommended by law school deans were, in no specific order, English, also called literature, history, philosophy, and political science, also called government. I want to say those four majors again, English, history, philosophy, and political science. 
But there's a caveat to this. There's a big, big caveat to this. More important than the major you pick are the grades you get. So pick a major that you like and you're going to do well in. All things being equal, I would put my money on the applicant who is a fashion major with a 3.9 GPA over the 3.4 GPA history major candidate any day. Pick a major that you like. I do entire workshops on how to get better grades, but I want to throw in here as a bonus three guaranteed ways to get better grades. This is three guaranteed GPA boosters. I guarantee you it works. And I always get people who are skeptical about it. They try it. I get calls and emails a semester, a year later, people saying, Daryl, it actually worked. It always works. One, give yourself an internal deadline of one week prior on all major assignments. This does not mean you do any more work. It just means you complete the assignment one week before the professor says it's due. Second, ask your professor for comments on your work before you submit it. You'll be surprised. Most professors will allow you to submit work early and they'll give you comments. This is a guaranteed way to get a better grade. Third, write down everything the professor writes on the board. Trust me, if the professor is taking the time to write it on the board, it's going to show up again. And this is, this is the weird thing about this. You don't even, I don't encourage it, but you don't even have to go back and read the notes. The very fact that you wrote it down is going to make a difference. Try it. Three guaranteed ways to get better grades. And I graduated as valedictorian of my college class. So trust me, I know what I'm talking about on this. The LSAT. The Law School Admission Test, LSAT, or LSAT for short, is a half-day standardized test administered four times each year at designated testing centers throughout the world. All American Bar Association approved law schools require applicants to take the LSAT as part of their admissions process. Unlike in college, where you can choose to take the SAT or ACT, for law school, you must take the LSAT. I get more questions about the LSAT than I do on any other element of the admissions process. The main question, of course, is what is the score someone needs to get into Harvard Law School? And every time I repeat my answer, it's met with the same look of skepticism. My answer, there is not one LSAT score that is guaranteed to get you into Harvard. I'm not trying to be difficult or let people down easy, as it were. It's true. There's no magic score or cutoff. In fact, both Harvard and Yale turn down applicants with a perfect 180 LSAT each year. So clearly, there's no magic score. In 2010, the national average was 152. This is on a scale of 120 to 180. 152 was the national average. That should be your baseline. Bottom line, the closer you are to 180 and the farther you are from 152, the better your chances. Three things to remember. First, in spite of the historical importance of the LSAT, in recent years, admissions committees are putting less weight on it in an effort to adopt a more whole person evaluation. Second, because your scores are based on your performance on one test on one day, it seems much more daunting than it really is. Third and last, although the LSAT might be the most important test you've ever taken, it's still only a test. And just like any other test you've ever taken, you can prepare for it. Start early. If I were a betting man, I would always bet my money on the person who starts preparing for the LSAT earlier. The LSAT is a skills-based 
test and not a knowledge-based test. So you are not advantaged by waiting later in your collegiate career to take it. In fact, you might be disadvantaged, especially if you've already graduated. Plan to take the LSAT by your senior year if you're still an undergraduate. Trust me, you will have too many other things on your plate by then to give it the attention it deserves. Besides, many law schools require that the LSAT be taken by December for admission the following fall. So you want to put yourself in the best position time-wise. You can take the LSAT at any time. I recommend that you begin preparing to take it as soon as you are pretty certain that you are going to attend law school. Take a practice test to gauge where you are. Do not take the real test to gauge where you are. I have to repeat this because I see so many highly qualified applicants make this mistake. Do not take the real test to gauge where you are. The LSAT is not the SAT. You want this to be a one hitter quitter. Practice, practice, practice. Sure, there are strategies that can help you navigate the minefield that is the LSAT more effectively, but the best way is good old-fashioned practice. I know I said this before, but I have to reiterate. Do not go into the LSAT blind. If the first time you take a full test is when you're sitting for the actual one, you are at a huge disadvantage. I don't care how clever you think you might be. If the first time you take a full test is when you're sitting for the actual one, you're at a huge disadvantage. It is imperative that you begin practicing as soon as you are pretty certain that you want to attend law school. Don't wait until your senior year or later on just for the sake of waiting, thinking you have time. And don't wait until you take a certain class thinking they are going to teach you some special shortcut. No matter how low you think your score is when you take your practice test, you'll be benefited by knowing it earlier and being proactive about it. Remember, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Start practicing early. I spent more than 15 months practicing for the LSAT. So that may be a bit on the extreme side, but I spent 15 months preparing for the LSAT. So I know the value of practice. I know it firsthand. No one is born a good test taker if there's even such a thing. Granted, some people are more inclined to do better on standardized tests, but almost no one was born with these skills. Rather, they are acquired and refined through things like childhood games or experiences one was exposed to in their upbringing. Bottom line, you can be as good as anyone else is on the LSAT. The only question is how much work are you willing to devote? Get the books that have real, actual LSATs and start doing them. Do them over and over and over again. Remember Michael Caine's words, rehearsal is the work. Practice is the relaxation. Stage a dress rehearsal. Duplicate real-time testing conditions. Don't take the practice test at home in a quiet space. Instead, go somewhere that you can practice with distractions, like a Starbucks or a local bookstore. Have a plan and commit to it. Write down your target score before you even begin practicing in earnest. Trust me on this. Write down your target score before you even begin practicing. Keep that number close to you throughout the time that you're practicing. Students who have a clear vision of what they want out of life are much more likely to achieve it. Write your vision. Make it plain. Plan how much and when you intend to practice per week. In the three months leading up to the LSAT, you should be practicing at least four times per week. That's at least one entire LSAT per week. Aim to have taken 20 full tests by the time you sit for the real one. I want to say that again. Aim to have taken 20 full LSATs 
by the time you sit for the real one. Confucius said, when your goals seem unrealistic, don't scale down your dreams, step up your effort. Remember that. Use all of the resources available to you. The $1,000 plus score buster classes are great, I'm sure, or so I've been told. But if you were like me and could not afford that, you have to be more proactive. Today, many colleges and universities provide access to low-cost LSAT preps courses, and some offer them as electives. Some community-based organizations now have prep programs as well. The Internet also has a wealth of information on LSAT preparation. Plan to take the LSAT when you know you will have the most free time. Although it sounds so simple, many students don't. I made this mistake myself. The first time I took the LSAT, it was the morning after our junior class pageant, and I was class president. I still remember me leaving the nightclub early from the after party just hours before and thinking to myself, this is going to be bad. And sure enough, it was. Learn from me. Don't do what I did. To retake it or not to retake it. The only thing worse than going through the LSAT is going through the LSAT again. If you're wondering whether or not you should retake it, ask yourself three questions. Did something happen during your first test that significantly diminished your performance? How likely is it that you will improve your score the second time around? Did you score significantly lower than you had on your practice test? Bottom line, if you have to ask yourself most likely you need to retake it. I mean, let's be honest. If you knock it out of the park, you wouldn't even consider retaking it. The problem is that most people don't want to put in the effort, so they make an excuse why they won't retake it, or why they can't retake it. And they say things like, well, if it's meant to be, it'll be. I actually retook the LSAT myself, so I know the feeling. I advise my clients the same thing my mentor advised me when I was in the position, although I definitely did not want to hear it then. You only get one JD ever. You can only get one JD. Will you be able to say for the rest of your life you could live with your score? That was enough. However, know that the stakes are higher, definitely higher the second time around. Many law schools compare your original test score to your scores on subsequent tests, and some the average or the most recent one while requiring disclosure of all scores. Do your absolute best. I advise all of my clients, you should determine where you want to attend law school and make up in your mind that you will apply before you ever get a test back. Do not choose to apply based on your scores. People who pick the schools they will apply to based on their scores generally don't fare as well as those who had decided it before they began the process. This goes back to what we talked about, seeing it as done. This is precisely why it is imperative you do your best on the LSAT. Only you really know if you did your best. When you know that you put your best foot forward on the LSAT, you will have the confidence that is crucial in the waiting game, regardless of your actual score. Recommendations. Most recommendations. Most schools require three or more letters of recommendations from professors or others in a position to know you and your abilities well. It's good to say great things about yourself in your application, but it's always better to have someone else say them. Such is the power of the recommendation. There are two primary categories of candidates who are most benefited by a compelling recommendation. Borderline admissible candidates at any law school and competitive candidates at the most selective law school. 
goals. Do your homework first. The policies regarding recommendations vary from school to school. Read each of your applications carefully to determine one, how many letters each school requires, and two, if there are requirements on who should write the letters. Determine the deadlines so you know which ones take precedence. The rule of thumb is that you want to give your recommenders at least one month notice. Know who to ask and how to ask. First, on the who to ask. Anyone is fair game to be a recommender. Anyone who's not related to you. Teachers, counselors, coaches, mentors. Pick at least two professors who can speak thoroughly on your academic record. I want to say this again. Pick at least two professors who can speak thoroughly on your academic record record, even if the school only requires one. Two will never hurt. Yes, schools are interested in your range of abilities and skills, but at the end of the day, it's about the academics. Only ask people who know you well and who like you. As commonsensical as it sounds, I see highly qualified students make this mistake all the time. Sure, it's great to have the mayor of your city right on your behalf, but not if the only thing the mayor can say about you is your name. Admissions committees will know the difference between a genuine endorsement and some form letter typed up by the secretary. Don't ask people to recommend you who don't like you. Don't ask people to recommend you who don't like you. Don't ask people to recommend you who don't like you. I'm telling you, I see highly qualified students make this mistake all the time. I just don't get it. It doesn't matter how well they know you. If they don't like you, don't ask. Your application should be a glowing reflection of you and your potential for success, not a mixed bag of reserved praise and mild skepticism. And don't push someone to recommend you either. If they're hesitant, then take that as your cue. I mean, you wouldn't try to persuade a doctor to perform surgery on you. Now on the how to ask. Help them help you. When you ask a person to recommend you, provide them with the following information. A cover letter. This is the formal request that includes all of your basic personal information and any relevant application requirements. The recommendation form a stamped addressed envelope, your resume, an unofficial transcript, and a copy of your personal statement. If you know you have certain weaknesses which are clear in your application, ask your recommenders to address the issue in their letters. For instance, if you score low on the LSAT but have a high GPA or vice versa. Again, this is about effectively marketing yourself to the law school admissions committee. The point is to get your recommenders to be on board with helping to market you to the applications committee. Network, network, network. Talk to friends, family, and alumni who have attended the school of your choice. This is not the time to be shy. Work your connections and ask for recommendations. Relationships are everything. Make a networking plan.